Hey, Doc. <clears throat> um, definitely a cool case to have a conversation about. Uh, to implant overdenture for a patient with a lower <coughs> mandibular feeling dentition. Uh, <coughs> definitely a lot of cool things we can discuss, um, different ways to go about this. Uh, I'm going to start with the MISH's classification for lower um, implant sites for removable prostheses. Uh, he breaks it down into A, B, C, D, E. Uh, the current locations you have here are A and E. Uh, the B and D sites would probably be a little bit more <clears throat> um, in between the canine and the lateral is typically where we put them. Uh, in Misha's text, he says um, those locations are essentially zones equally distributed between the mental foramina. <clears throat> so here we're you know kind of nudging up against the um, the canals. So I think if we take this implant, we put it here. We're going to have uh, a better anterior posterior spread. So the reason why it's important to consider where you place these two implants, the farther back you go, and I'll use the arch form to have that conversation. So it has to do with the AP spread. So you can imagine if you go back farther here and here, there's going to be a larger anterior cantilever that causes rotation around that fulcrum between the two implants. So if you're doing for implants, yes, you use the A and the B and the D and the E's. Um, you can even add the fifth and go in the midline, although there's a consideration uh, down here with, um, <clears throat> you know, inadvertently coming through the lingual plate. There's a very significant artery in that area. Uh, so for most cases, we want to be careful about not adding to the midline. Uh, we're just making the point here that the number of implants does have an impact on the AP spread. If we're choosing two, which is the most common plan, which is what I think you're doing here, then really the B and the D locations give us the most anterior um, position of the implants, which means the fulcrum line between the two implants is as far underneath the incisal edge of the teeth, which gives the least amount of rotation around that access because everything, all of the occlusal forces are distributed behind that line. Uh, if you get them too close to each other and you maximize that effect, you have a law of diminishing return where your retention of the implants actually starts to decrease. So the B and the D locations are correct. They're just a little bit more uh, towards the midline than what you have here, uh, which is kind of a good thing that we're going to go inside a little bit because the available bone that we have here um, is good but not great. I'm not even sure I'd call it good. I'd call it fair. You know, so the implant you placed here is definitely encased within bone, but we can imagine that the blood supply uh, to the bone on the outside of the implant, as is proposed here, will be little to little to none based on the fact that this is cortical bone and not cancellous bone. So <clears throat> lots of implants exist like this and they're successful. Uh, the more and more we're starting to understand the longevity of the implants, the more we understand we really want to have a wider ridge with more cancellous bone around the implant. So the goal is, especially with these triangular shaped ridges, and in Mish's textbook, he has a whole classification on the edentious mandible. I think he calls this a B slash H ridge. Um, I might be wrong. Uh, but his recommendation for these ridges when they're very thin at the top is that we reduce it and then have the head of the implant be within better uh, cancellous to cortical bone ratio, which would probably be right about here. So if you were to take this approach, which would definitely be my recommendation, you're looking at about eight millimeters of reduction, which still leaves you a massive amount of bone to place a nice implant for this lady. The downside to that is you need to lay a flap and you know, be a lot more aggressive with your surgery. You're more than competent in being able to do that. Uh, but what it's going to involve is extracting all the teeth, laying a full flat, flattening the ridge until, we can go over this when that appointment time comes, until your ridge width is 7 millimeters. Uh, let's go like this. <clears throat> now what that 7 millimeters gives us is a 4 millimeter implant with 1.5 millimeters of bone on either side. I wouldn't say there's anything magical about that. The farther down you go, the wider the ridge gets, the more bone you have outside of the housing of the implant. With that said, you don't want to go down too far because then we have 
the prosthetic to implant ratio, which is not something well established in the literature, but think of it as a crown root ratio. Um, it's relatively not important when you have splinted prostheses, but it is more relevant when you have uh, something like this, like an overdenture. So <clears throat> my gut tells me you're gonna be fine if you reduce right down to there, and then we have a nice long implant longevity. I would be extra um, uh, eager to do this if she's a smoker, a diabetic, compromised in some way based on what she has here. I really wanna have as much bone around that implant as possible. You know, threading the needle like this might be good in a healthy patient, um, definitely not in a patient that is exhibited tooth loss like this. So bring these two implants into their B and D locations. Um, bring the head of the implant down like so. Now, I know you know this, but because the patient has teeth, we have the opportunity to do uh, what I call the flux plan, uh, which is essentially the idea of placing the implants while the patient still has some teeth, doing a valplast partial or a QCIL overdenture partial uh, that goes around select teeth. And I think for her case, if you kept maybe one or two of the premolars over here, remove these, get your implant in. This implant's gonna be pretty easy to place because there's no teeth there. Keep this guy, remove that guy. Then the patient heals with a lower partial during the interim period. Um, that's far better than waiting three to four months for these two implants to heal, or even worse, one of these implants doesn't take and then they have to wait even longer. So it's a, it's a nice way to bridge the gap for patients if she's fine gumming it or having a lower complete denture, um, you don't have to go to this extent, but I haven't met many patients that navigate that time period very well. So the flux plan is something I, I would strongly consider here. Again, keeping at least two decent teeth that will ultimately be extracted, um, flattening your ridge, placing your implants, delivering an immediate valplast style denture, partial denture, and then uh, when the implants are all healed, you have your final denture ready to go. So you do the denture workup while they're in that um, healing period. And then you go forward and um, remove the remaining teeth and flatten the ridge accordingly. So. All right, man. Um, that should be it. Keep me posted, and thanks for reaching out. Take care.